And tonight, we're going to hear from Brad about fundamentals of fly fishing. Have you ever wanted to try it? A lot of people think about, you know, the movie A River Runs Through It. But for Brad, fly fishing takes him to beautiful places and is a, and is a sport that challenges him. Our presenter... Brad developed a love of outdoors and specifically fly fishing for trout while going up in, growing up in Wisconsin. His father handed him a fly rod at an early age and he fished for many years before obtaining the skills to land the elusive 14 inch brown trout. His love of trout fishing and desire to protect water quality motivated him to earn his bachelor's and master's degree in biology with an emphasis in aquatic science, ecology, and contaminants. He's worked more than 30 years with federal, state, and tribal agencies and nonprofit organizations in the environmental and natural resources field. Brad's been fly fishing in streams and lakes in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and elsewhere for more than 50 years. And he has it as his mission to share his knowledge and experience and love of fly fishing and conservation. He wants to give us a foundation of knowledge so that we can get started too, to enjoy fly fishing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And thank you, Fran, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, that'll save me from talking a little bit about myself. Um, but uh, I just wanna thank the Minnesota Rovers for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing my love and my knowledge about fly fishing. This is a picture of me here with an 18 inch brown trout that I caught and released in the Rush River in Wisconsin. And I caught it on a black woolly bugger. So I just got a, a little outline here that I, this is what I want to talk about. I'll give a brief introduction of myself and fly fishing and then I'll go into the equipment that you would need and then the techniques, just some of the techniques and tips, and then a brief summary at the end, and then uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions. So like uh, Fran said some in my introduction, I grew up fishing and hunting and camping in Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, I've been fishing all of my life and um, I learned something new every time I go out. And so I want to give a caveat that there may be folks on this, you know, Zoom meeting that know more about a lot of different things than I do. I don't know everything. I'm always learning. Um, I hope to uh, show some facts and, so, you know, some tips. Uh, some of the things I'll say will, will be my opinion. And if you talk to 20 people who fish, you might get 20 different opinions on a lot of different issues like what flies to use and that kind of thing. I have, I enjoy fishing, fly fishing for panfish, bass, and trout, uh, but most, mostly the talk, I'll probably talk mostly about trout fishing, but you know, fly fishing can be used to catch basically any, any fish there is out there. So I have two goals. I just hope to share my love of fly fishing with the Minnesota Rovers and other folks on the Zoom meeting and provide a basic foundation. If you don't know much about fly fishing, uh, maybe it can help you get started. You see if you're interested or not. Now, this is me back in 1985 with a 21 inch brown trout that I caught. And that was the last one of that size that I've kept. Uh, I've caught larger trout since then, but I practice catch and release for the most part. Sometimes I'll keep, you know, a 12 inch to eat because they do taste good. But uh, for the most part, I like to let them go. Here's kind of a definition from this L.L. Bean fly fishing handbook by Dave Whitlock. Fly fishing is a purely personal and manual method of sport fishing that involves the casting, presentation, and manipulation of an artificial fly to hook, play, and land fish. And I just highly recommend this book. I'll show more pictures from it and talk about it a little bit. Uh, it's just full of 
information. It just takes you through everything you ever wanted to know about fly fishing. So as far as equipment, there are five main components to, you know, to fly fishing. So you have the fly rod, the reel, the fly line, the leader, and the fly. And I'll go through each of these in the next section, all under equipment. So a fly rod is designed to control linear shaped and weighted fly line. It's a totally different way of casting than most people are used to with a, with a bait or a spinning rod. They're generally longer and more supple than other fishing rods. And if you're going to think about maybe trying fly fishing, you know, you want to consider what are you going to be fishing for? What's your level of skill? And also what you can afford. Um, it, it doesn't have to be expensive, but there are thousand dollar rods out there. This is just the picture shows a collection of four rods that I own from a seven foot to a nine foot fly rod. When you get a fly rod, you have to cur uh, fly line weight. And usually rods made in the last 25, 30 years, they have it written right on the rod. What, what is the weight of this rod? And you just use the same weight line. There's basically, uh, you know, there's lightweight fly rods, which range from one to four weight, they're called. And that would be for like small trout and panfish. A medium weight fly rod would be like from five to eight weight. And that's a good general pole or rod, can't call it a pole, um, for catching most fish less than three to four pounds. If you want to go after bigger fish, like large trout, northern bass, or even ocean fish, you want to use heavy weight, like nine to 15 weight. And this picture is my oldest child uh, fly fishing in Goodhue County. There are basically four types of rod material. The bamboo split cane was, uh, you could call it perhaps, you know, the old fashioned kind. A lot of fly rods were made uh, of that material for the last hundred years or so. I don't know exactly when they started to be made, but that's kind of what they used to be made of before fiberglass and graphite were invented. Um, Fiberglass, that was my first fishing rod was a fiberglass rod. And they're still good fly rods, they work great. Uh, but when graphite came along, the fly rods got more lightweight and still had a lot of power. And so that's really the most common today. And some of the composite rods, they add special compounds, boron or uh, other, compounds to add flexibility and strength. As far as the rod action, it's, action is the technical term, which really means the flexibility. A fast action rod is gonna be pretty stiff. A medium action rod is gonna be some bend, it'll give you, a, you know, more bend than, than the fast action rod. And then a slow action rod is, would be like a, a rod that's uh, really limber. If you wiggle it in your hand, it would just kind of wiggle like a, a wet noodle kind of a thing. Um, I don't recommend a slow limber rod unless you really want to go in after some small fish to make it fun. Uh, so this picture is just my eight foot graphite fly rod that I was fishing in Wabasha County. So now about the reel, the fly reel, the main function of a reel is to hold the fly line and backing during casting and fishing. Um, most fishermen, fisher people put a uh, braided line on the, on the line, on the reel first, 
like a 20 to 30 pound test braided line and then they attach the fly line to that and i don't know if you can see in the picture the white on the reel that's the backing line and what that does it, it's there if you do have a big fish that takes all your line out you've got extra line but also it makes the coils in the fly line bigger so it's easier to straighten it out when you pull the, the fly line out there are basically three types of fly reels this is a picture of a single action it's the most common it's really basic one turn of the the crank makes the spool turn once so it's one to one multiplier reel would be like if you turn the crank once it would reel in maybe two to three times so around the line i don't know if i've ever seen one of those i'm sure they're out there it'd be good for somebody who makes long casts and want to reel in their line quicker and there's also automatic fly reels which my father always used one of those um, they're usually uh, small they don't hold a lot of line so sometimes there's no room for backing but uh, they're kind of neat and they you know as you pull a line out it creates tension on a spring and then you push a button and then it reels the line back in when you're done fishing so that's it for the reel for now and then now the line uh, some folks think that this may be the most important component of the fly tackle system. It's uh, fortunately all of the fly line makers standardized the line and it's, it's so it's calculated by the weight of the first 30 feet. And kind of like the rods, the, the fly line weights, they range from 1 to 15 which one would be a really lightweight line and 15 a real heavy line with uh, in the middle five to eight weights being the most popular. This is a this picture is a diagram uh, in that LL Bean handbook showing you how to tie your fly line to your backing and uh, I just had to show my brother that it looks just like the picture in the book so I did a good job tying that together. So more about fly line, uh, there's a braided core inside the line that gives the strength. And then that braided core is coated with PVC or vinyl or other kinds of plastics that provides the weight, shape, size, and color of the line. So the composition of that coating then determines you know, how dense is the fly line. Well, which leads to the three kinds of line. Is it a floating line? Is it a sinking line? Or is it somewhere intermediate in the middle that kind of half floats, half sinks? Fly line also has shapes, which just means, you know, level shape just means that the braid and coating, they're level throughout the, the length of the line. A double taper line is another common fly line. It's tapered on the each end for several feet. And this, since it tapers, it can permit a more delicate and controlled cast. And then another common line is weight forward or WF line. It's similar to a double taper, except it has a short, shorter heavy midsection, which helps you increase distance as you cast. Now the leader, a lot of people don't understand what this is, so I'll try to do my best to explain it, but at the, what you do is you tie your leader on at the end of your fly line. It's the low visibility line that goes between your heavy fly line and your fly. So low visibility means low visibility to, to the fish. You don't want the fish to see the line, otherwise that'll spook them. They, they make really good uh, tapered leaders that are kind of thick where you tie it on to your fly line and then it gets thinner and thinner all the way to the end, uh, which helps deliver the fly to the water gently. And also you, know, you can use that, the leader is also used to float, swim or 
you know, sink your fly. And most people that trout fish, including myself, or that fly fish, will add a tippet on the end of the leader, just another 18 to 24 inches. That's the work, like a working line. You can decide what pound test you want to use. And that adds li life to your leader because a tapered leader can cost a few dollars. But if you can have it last longer by you know, adding a, a tippet, that, that's a good thing for fly, fly fishers. And again, this is from the LLB handbook showing the double surgeon's knot and how you tie a tippet to the end of your leader. And that's a really good knot to know. And uh, yeah, so that's it for that. So with all that, before I get to the fly, I just, this is just my opinion and the opinion of others. You know, you wanna get, if you wanna look at getting a first rod, you should probably look at about a six or seven weight, get a medium action, maybe eight to eight and a half foot. If you're, uh, you know, like a two piece rod would be fine. They do come in three, four, or even six piece rods. Uh, I just don't want, really wanna deal with six pieces personally. Uh, two or four works pretty good. Uh, just get yourself a single action reel. Again, it's just, it's just simple. You just put the line on there. That's all you really need. It holds the line and the backing. And then match it, your rod with the six or seven weight, weight forward line. That'll help you cast uh, when you're learning to cast. And then get some leaders, 6X to 3X, which means about three pound test to eight pound test. I like shorter leaders from six to seven and a half feet. Many fisher like fisher people like uh, longer, nine feet to 12 feet. I just think when you're already adding another two feet on the end of this, an eight foot to nine and a half foot leader is, is plenty for small streams around here. So now we'll go into the flies. Oh, I'm sorry, one, one more thing about the fly rod and reel. Um, I, I don't have a slide about this, but where, where to get uh, this kind of stuff. You can go to fly shops, you can buy these things online. You might get lucky and find a rod at Goodwill. Uh, Fleet Farm and Cabela's sells, sells rods and reels and stuff. And um, yeah, just also, you know, check with family members. Maybe, maybe grandpa has an old fly rod in the garage he's not using or something like that. So what is a fly? It's basically an artificial lure used to imitate a natural food such as an insect or a fish or to stimulate a fish into striking it. Flies are usually, they're very lightweight, usually less than a six, 1 64th of an ounce. And that's why you need the fly line to cast them. They are handmade from natural and synthetic materials such as feathers and fur and threads and plastics. And this is just a picture of a selection of flies, <coughs> excuse me, in my fly box. Um, I purchased a few flies from Cabela's and it's nice that they label them. They tell you what the name of the fly is and the size. And so if you read about something in a book, you can usually go find it uh, at that same fly. So there are two main categories of flies, wet fly, which is a sinking fly, and then dry fly, which would be more of a floating fly. So wet flies imitate a wide range of submerged organisms like insect, nymphs, minnows, crayfish, leeches, and worms, anything that might, a fish might come across in a lake or stream. Wet flies are basically more effective overall. And that's, that's what some people say, and that could be opinion. Maybe some people like dry flies, but fish, mostly they feed, are feeding underwater. This is a picture of a, of a nymph, which is a wet fly. 
Now dry flies, they ride on the surface or right in the surface of the water. And they're made with very light materials and how they're made allows them to sit on top of the water. Uh, they're all, they also imitate aquatic and terrestrial insects and other small animals. Usually you have to spray or use wax to keep a fly dry and floating. This is a picture my nephew sent me of a small dry fly that he made. So when you're considering what fly to use, the size, the shape, the color, they're all important aspects, you know, in, in selecting a fly. The materials that are used to make it will determine if it's wet or dry. And some folks, you know, consider streamers as different than wet or dry. I would consider a streamer like a wet fly, but they represent minnows and there's all kinds of bugs, bug kind of flies that you can get that are float on the surface to imitate insects, frogs, and mice. And again, this is another selection of of flies that I have. Now well, this, uh, it's a little bit jumbled here, but I, this is some of my favorite flies. What I want to point out is kind of like a table here. Um, mayflies have a, a nymp stage and they also have an adult stage when they're like dry flies. So a wet fly for, to imitate a mayfly, a good nymph would be like a hare's ear. That's a, one of my favorite flies. I like to use it generally anywhere because most streams have mayflies in them. There's many, many species of mayflies. So, a, you know, a dry fly, you can get many different kinds of dry flies that imitate a mayfly. So, again, you want to get, you know, different sizes and colors. Uh, some of my favorite is a, I don't know if you can see the, the first one here, it's BWO, which stands for blue winged olive. That's a real common dry fly that imitates a small mayfly. And then uh, I can't quite see the other, I can't remember what the other one is, uh, um, but it's another dry fly that imitates a mayfly. So then there's caddis bugs that live in the stream too. They live as a, a larval stage. And that's what this first fly here, a wet fly would be a caddis olive. That's what it kind of imitates a nymph or a larval stage of a caddis. And then the caddis Matthews here in the drop card, that, um, that would imitate an adult or an emergent you know, a flying caddis. And though that's a real common insect that's in streams and lakes. And um, so it's good to have a selection of flies that imitate that. And a couple of my other favorite flies are wet flies. The scud, I like to use the scud in streams that have vegetation. If there's vegetation in the stream, then there'll probably be a scud, which is a small crustacean that lives in the, in the stream. And then the woolly bugger is another one of my favorite all around flies. Most people have those, they're easy to make. They imitate like a small leech or, or sometimes a minnow. Those are some of my favorites. So, say in the beginning, but, oh, maybe I did a little bit, but, you know, there's so much information. I'm, I'm just touching the surface of all of this stuff. I could, uh, I have probably eight to 10 hours of material prepared, but I had to whittle it down to about 30 minutes, hopefully. Um, so I'm really touching the surface. Um, but you can really learn a lot about natural foods in, in this, another book by Dave Whitlock. He's got an amazing book there. Uh, it's really a fun hobby to learn to tie your own flies. There are books that show you how to do that. Or if you're lucky like me, you have a brother that's an amazing uh, fly tire. He helped me tie this, this fly here on the right, on the bottom, a woolly bugger, uh, just a couple weeks ago. And then he's also 
going to be like an imitation crayfish and an imitation uh, hexagenia mayfly, which is a big mayfly that trout just love when they when they hatch. Probably 90% of the flies I have in my fly box are from my brother, so I appreciate that. If you can find someone that knows how to tie flies, get to know them. So now just a little bit, I'm just gonna brush over all this other stuff that you, that you wanna have. Uh, you wanna have waders, you wanna have good, durable, lightweight, um, clothing, uh, loose fitting, you don't want it to be tight and you just want to be relaxed. Um, a good hat is good to have, rain jacket, fishing vest, sunglasses, some other accessories, you know, you want to have sunglasses so you can see. You know, you know, polarized sunglasses are invaluable to see into the water. And of course you want clippers and a creel, if you don't know what a creel is in this picture here, you can see I'm, I've kind of got, I got my hat, my sunglasses, I'm wearing a vest, and my creel is on my hip here. And a creel can hold, you know, your lunch, your water. Um, if you want to keep a fish, you can put them in there. Um, and I'm wearing my waders. And, you know, bring all the stuff that you would need for fly fishing and anything else you would take on an outing, you know, for safety, uh, for sun, sunscreen. Um, so I know I'm just brushing over that, but uh, you know, just, you just wanna have the basics. You wanna have all that along. So now I'll go a little bit into uh, some techniques and tips. So, a definition of fly casting would be a precisely timed and controlled cycle of stroking motions that energize and direct the line and, and the fly along an accurate path to the water. So it, it, what you want to do is focus on directing the line to where you want it to go and not the fly. So is that easy peasy? Does that sound easy? Um, it may or may not be depending on your skill. But here's a friend of mine fishing in the Root River and the photo there. Now this is the, the four part fly casting technique. I'll try to buzz through this. Uh, but if you can just look at the diagram, when in number one, you're just lifting the rod, your pickup, you're lifting the line off of the water. So you get the line off of the water. And then number two, you upstroke, which is your back cast. You lift the rod up, you accelerate as you lift, and then you stop at about the vertical. You know, some could say 12 o'clock, some may say one o'clock, a little bit past 12 o'clock. You accelerate and you stop. And then the two way is a pause. You wanna pause and let your line roll out to the back. And then the downstroke, Number three, you bring the, you, you power the rod forward. It's called the forward cast or the downstroke. So you accelerate, but you stop at about 10 o'clock and that delivers the line towards the target. And then 3A again is to pause, let the line unroll. And then four, the presentation, you just lower the rod as the line drops and you, you know, direct the line leader and the fly to your target. And you know, in general, the casting plane, uh, a lot of folks may think that it's just horizontal across the surface, but it is actually angled down towards your, your target. So that, that's a really simple way to look at it, but you really have to go out and practice. It's important to, you know, practice without trying to fish. If you go somewhere, you can go out on a lawn, you can go in a gymnasium, you can go at a pond to try to try fly casting. Um, use a safe fly, use something like with a cut hook or a piece of yarn, because um, you're probably gonna hit yourself with it and everyone does. You, know, you can try aiming for a target, 
Um, another technique is to, you can turn and watch your fly as the loop unfolds to kind of work on your timing. Uh, some problems, you know, that I've run into, I've, I've had friends that make it sound like a whip. So you're whipping it and that you're just going to whip your fly right off the end. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Uh, and they do go wrong. It happens all the time. Some other techniques or tips is to keep your wrist firm, keep your thumb on top of the rod. Might be a good idea to learn from an instructor or watch videos. And it's important, you know, especially if somebody's watching you, just to relax and don't get too excited. Just relax, take a few deep breaths and, and just just get, get into the motion. Um, the most important step where most of the energy is, is, is in the pickup. That's where most of the power is loaded into a cast. And uh, I can't remember if I mentioned or in Fran's introduction, I never had any instruction. Um, I've just learned over the years. I learned what works and what doesn't work. And uh, I still have problems. I still, my line still, goes in a heap and drops in front of me. Uh, so it's never perfect. So now, you know, just the, the difference between calm water versus running water. Calm water is, is quite simple. Um, you just, you're casting out on a lake or a pond and you just cast, work your fly back to you. Try to find the depth and the action that the fish are looking for or at the right depth. Line drag is seldom a problem unless like on a windy day it might blow your line. On flowing water it gets a little bit more complex. Uh, it requires many different casting and retrieving techniques. Um, I should say like when I talked about that four-part cast when you're out actually out there on the river or on a lake, it just usually there's always something in the way. There's a tree, or there's grass behind you. You almost never get to use that perfect four part fly fishing system uh, unless you know, you know, it, it's good to find places that you can do that. Uh, but most streams, it, it's impossible if you want to fish the, the stream. The most common technique is to deliver your fly to the water and let it drift naturally, either under the surface or on the surface. And that's usually what most bugs are doing under underwater or on top of the water, but not always. Uh, sometimes you can you know, pull your fly, make it go faster than the, the stream, pull it downstream. You can pull your fly across the stream or even upstream against the current. So you can experiment, you know, with movement, with uh, drifting your fly and see what the trout are interested in and in, in biting on. One of the biggest things about fly fishing, and I could spend an, another hour or two, just where do you put your fly? You know, you want to put it in an area that you suspect will hold fish. I'll talk a little bit about that, I think, in the next slide. but. Um, most fly fishing is done by walking and wading, but you know, don't rule out getting in a canoe or any kind of watercraft. It can get you to some hard to reach places. You can still fly fish and it's a lot of fun. So it's just important to, uh, you know, before you cast, look around and see what's around you, know your limitations. You know, how far do you think you're going to be able to cast and, and try to set yourself up to cast where the fish are. So be patient. Again, you know, many mistakes will occur. I probably spend half of my time untying knots, getting my flies out of trees, out of snags. Uh, some people don't like that, but that's part of the ball game. You're, you're going to get snagged on things. It's also important to be courteous to other fishers and that that could be another 15 minute talk. Uh, basically, you know, be friendly, give people room, 
don't don't jump in the water above up, upstream of them. You're going to kick up all kinds of mud and silt down to them, and that's just not nice. So give people plenty of space, or go go somewhere else if there's somebody there. Real brief on setting the hook. You have to react quickly. Or the fish will, you know, reject the fake food within a couple seconds. Um, larger hooks require more energy to strike to set the hook. Um, with experience, you get more of a reflex action. I think my reflexes are are too good. Uh, sometimes I'll set the hook. I'll be too excited and set the hook and break my line because I, I, I just, it just got me excited, you know. Uh, large fish, they have the ability to take out line, to dive into cover, and to break your line. But that, with all that, that's still one of the most exciting parts about fly fishing is, is getting on a big one that you just can't hold. It's like, it's a blast. You always want to maintain a, a taut line to keep the hook embedded in the fish. And you know, before you go, know what your rod capabilities are and know what kind of line you're using. Um, if you're using three pound tests and you get a four pound fish on, you better fight them real gently uh, so he doesn't break your line and hope for the best. When you fight a fish, you want to keep your rod up at you know, 45 degree angles or so, so that the, let, use the rod, let the rod absorb the tension of fighting the fish and just enjoy it. Uh, they'll jump, they'll fight, they'll go upstream, downstream. Uh, it's just a blast uh, when you get on a, a trout. So enjoy the battle. Don't, you know, until the fish tires, uh, you don't wanna rush them in and you don't wanna just let them hang out there and fight forever either, because it'll wear them out. You know, unless uh, you wanna take some home to eat, but, um, I recommend catch and release. There's more and more and more people now, just like we've all seen since COVID, uh, hitting the outdoors, and that includes trout or fly fishing as well. So it's important to, in my opinion, to let the fish go and catch them again. But you want to use a, a, net, a shallow net made of a soft material. If you don't have a net, just gently grasp the fish and with wet hands, wet your hands and remove the fly with your finger or a tool such as a hemostat and release the fish as quickly as possible. Just hold the fish in the water until it upright, until it'll swim away on its own. So like I mentioned before, reading water, there's a whole book uh, here and there's more than this book, but this is a great book. It just goes into excruciating detail, but by learning where the trout are, I can save you hours and hours of unproductive fishing. You, you know, over time and experience and reading or, you know, just getting out there, you'll learn to recognize the structure of rocks and trees, other objects along the shoreline and the bottom. That's where fish will be lying because it, you know, provides protection and there's food and relief from strong currents. So as a general statement, fish will hide in the deeper, darker, and shaded water. One of the, what I really enjoy is doing my research and preparing during the off season. I, I love to read books and I learn, and um, I've checked out books from my library. You can get all kinds of trout fishing books from your library and then you decide which ones you really like and you want to have around. You don't want to give them back, so you, you buy those books. And then also gather as many free books from, you know, the DNR. They have publications that show, you know, where the trout streams are, what's in them, what kind of fish are in them. Um, and also, you know, all the maps, but also uh, the regulations. There's like this book here on the bottom left, trout fishing access that shows where there are easements on all the trout streams in southeastern Minnesota. When I was a kid, it didn't seem to be as important. Uh, landowners didn't really care a whole lot about people trout fishing in their 
you know, streams on their land. But now more and more properties are being posted. So you want to check with the landowner or go where there's public access. And also check the regulations. Uh, the main trout fishing season opens this Saturday on the 17th. So check the regulations so you know what's legal in the stream that, or that you want to fish. And then uh, you want to be safe when you're out there. Uh, my nephew sent me this picture, <laughs> retrieving his lure on a Missouri stream. Uh, you don't probably want to do that unless you're young and indestructible. Um, I have climbed trees before to get my fly back, but maybe not quite that high. Um, don't wade too deep, you know, just know your limits. Go with a friend. It's not only safer, but it's more enjoyable. And then always keep an eye on the weather, prepare for sun, rain, bugs, etc. So that's, uh, that's really it. I'll just summarize. Um, I just hope that I share enough pertinent information to maybe get you started if you're interested. That I find that fly fishing is a great excuse for me. I love birding, I love wildflowers, I love trees. I, you know, so when I'm out there, I can immerse myself in nature and do all that while I'm fly fishing. You can have the opportunity to share your experience with friends and family. And really over time, the best teacher is gonna be from experience. And like I said earlier, I learn something new every time I go out and you will too. And this is my picture of my niece with a rainbow trout. Um, I just wanna do one real quick quote from the book, A River Runs Through It. It's a great movie, great book. Uh, I really enjoyed it. But this quote reads, one great thing about fly fishing is that after a while, Nothing exists of the world but thoughts about fly fishing. So I, this book gives me inspiration to maybe write my own book someday. And so with that, I will stop. Uh, if there's anything else you want to know that we don't cover tonight, feel free to send me an email. And uh, I'm, I'm ready to entertain any questions if anybody has any. So Brad, maybe I could jump in first because there's some questions on the chat here that I could ask you. Okay. Um, one person says, I see that some are barbed and others not, I guess the hooks. Um, can you please explain what we do with barbs for catch and release? You mean all oh, the, the barbed hooks? Yes. Well, um, the barbed hooks, make it a little bit tougher to get off, but they still can come out. Um, if you really, really want to be a sportsman and easy catch and release, just crimp your bar down so that you don't, so you don't have one. Um, but, you know, most people keep the barb on there just because they don't want to lose the fish. You want to get it in. The barb helps keep the hook in, in the fish's mouth. But um, it, it makes it some, uh, just a little bit tougher to get the hook out than a barbless hook, but you can still get it out. Okay, next one. Uh, how do you tie your flies on when your eyes start going bad? Oh, that, that was a shocker when I went trout fishing, fly fishing for the first time in the year. And I said, like, what? I can't see my line. So that happened to me. Um, I don't know, you know, it depends a lot if you're nearsighted, farsighted, if you can get bifocals. Bifocals really helped me, but because I'm nearsighted, uh, I basically have to lift my glasses up and I can see close uh, to tie my knots. So yeah, that can be a problem as we age. That's a, that's a real bummer when you, you can't see your, your line anymore, but there's got to be a way. Use a magnifying glass. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll get your brother to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, right. 
do you need a license and what do they cost? Question mark, Wisconsin, question mark. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, you do. You need a fishing license uh, in any state that you want to fish. It depends on where you live. I live in Minnesota. So if I want to fish Wisconsin, I can buy a license over there. I usually, last couple of years, I bought an annual and I think it's $40 for a non-resident and then $10 for a trout stamp. So it's about $50. Um, I don't, I have the regulation book here somewhere, but I, I think in Minnesota licenses are around 18 or 20, maybe, maybe somebody else knows. Did, did that answer the question? Well, hopefully. Uh, any fly recommendations hopefully. on fish? Are you fishing for panfish when you fly fish? Yeah, yeah. With with panfish, uh, it's really fun to use a, like a popper, which uh, is a it's made of a little cork, and sometimes it has spider legs on it. Uh, bluegills love to hit poppers, but you can also use little, you know, little small nymphs that go under the water. Any kind of a mayfly nymph. Uh, if it's moving, the bluegill is going to be hard for them to resist it. But you'll want to give it action. You'll, you know, it's like they're usually in a pond or a lake. So you cast out and you, you know, twitch the popper along the surface or uh, a nymph under. Just kind of twitch it along back to you. So another one here. More general, over the years of your experience, is trout fishing in Minnesota getting better, worse, or staying the same? What was that? Is, is fishing in Minnesota getting better or is worse? Is trout fishing in Minnesota getting better, worse, or staying the same? Well, that's a very subjective question. <laughs> um, in my opinion, I have seen in Wisconsin and Minnesota, the state DNR has done an excellent job of making more trout waters. There's actually more miles of trout water now today than there was 30, 40 years ago. And that's through habitat restoration, better farm practices, shading streams, and putting in structures. Um, I, it's a very subjective. I think it depends on the lake, depends on the stream, depends on the time of year. There's so many variables. I just think that uh, there's always fish out there to be caught. And if you're not getting them somewhere, go try another spot. There's places where people don't fish at all. And if you get out and explore, you can find those, those secluded places. Okay, last one I'm gonna do here and then people can unmute themselves and ask other questions. Uh, what if you catch turtles? Do you just cut the line or what do you do? Or have so turtle soup? <laughs> <laughs> um, in the, it'd be rare. But you, you know, I have hooked turtles, you know, with bobbers and worms before. Um, it depends on how big the turtle is and what kind it is. If it's a snapping turtle, I would just cut the line and not deal with it. Uh, if it's a painted turtle and you have a pliers, you might be able to pop the hook out. Um, if you see a turtle coming for your lure, just pull it away. You don't want to hook them if you can help it. Anyone else have questions if you want to just unmute yourself and ask Brad a question? Oh, I, just, I just wanted to mention, yeah, some of the states have, uh, I've gone to Colorado and you may only be out there for a week or something, you can get a temporary license to, uh, I forget what it was, four day, and I think you can do two weeks or something like that. And it's. So you may not want to give it, if you're just there for the week, you may not want to buy an annual license. But. 
Yeah. Make sure you buy one. I think it's, it's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's not worth being out there without a license. Yeah. Good point, Quentin. Uh, a lot of times there's a, a one day or even a four day or a week long uh, license. If you're just going to go for a weekend, um, it just depends on what you're, yeah, what you want to do. But that's a really good point. You don't have to buy an annual non-resident. Um, usually if it's a resident, I don't know if, I don't think they allow a day or, or two days. I am not sure. But it's, but it's all regulation. Hey, about. Brad, good presentation. What, uh, what are some of the signs you look for in a river uh, to determine where the fish might be? Well, uh, that's a really good question. You know, I've been fly fishing and trout fishing so long, I can, I can just walk up to a hole and to me it's instinct. It's like, well, he's gonna be laying right there and that's where I put my lure. Um, but that doesn't help somebody that's never done it. You wanna look at the structure, you wanna look at the current. Um, fish can't just live in the straight hard current. They, they use too much energy. So they look for a break behind a rock, behind a log. Um, if you can see a long stretch of river or stream that you can see the bottom, that's probably dead water. There's gonna be no fish in there. You wanna look for, um, you know, streams have kind of a series of, you know, rapids, riffles, pool, tail, tail of the pool, and then it kind of starts over. Um, and trout will be laying, you know, a lot of times the bigger fish will be laying in the bottom of the pool, but they're hard to, hard to get, catch, you know, unless they're feeding, they'll come up toward the top end of the pool. Um, but, you know, you just get up and you can look at it in the water and sometimes you'll see trout rising. That's what you want to look for. Uh, if you see trout rising, then, you know, there's a trout right there. And you start fishing for that, that you know, where they're rising. So without, you know, I could go on like that book, Reading Trout Water is an amazing book. And he goes into so much detail. Um, but they, trout will look for protection from mostly predators from above. They don't want to get picked off by a, a hawk or an eagle. So they, they'll be deep, where, but the, out of the current and uh, where there's food. And most of the food comes from like the riffles. That's where the insects live in the riffles. So fish like to move up into the riffles or hang downstream of the riffles where the bugs will get dislodged and, and float down. Any other questions? Brad, this is this is Keith. I, I just want to uh, tell you that I appreciate your talk. I think you did a great job. Brad's taken me out a couple of times fishing, and he demonstrates an incredible amount of patience with a novice. Um, <laughs> he's done a really good job with me. Uh, Brad, can you? One thing that I was never really sure about is the the hook size. The hooks on the flies come in different sizes. And I don't know how you determine what size you should use with a particular fly. Well, okay. Um, as a general statement, when I first started fly fishing, I, I used to use some pretty big gaudy flies. And, uh, you know, you think bigger, better, you know, they're going to see a big old thing and, and hit it. But a lot of the trout are particular. They know that that's really not natural. And so I gradually decreased my fly size and I'm using, you know, 18, size 18, size 16. Um, the bigger the number, the smaller the fly. Some folks even use size 22 and 24 flies with their teeny tiny things about a quarter inch long. Um, but you basically, you want to 
try to guess what, what is in that stream and what may be hatching at that moment, which takes a lot of practice and skill and, and luck. Um, I would just say, you know, try, try different sizes, try wet flies. If you see fish uh, surfacing, you know, try a dry fly and see if you can get that one to bite. Um, but you want to, uh, most of the flies that you can buy, they'll be of a size of the insects that are in the water. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good, Brad. Thank you. I've got a question, Brad. Um, have, have you ever uh, tried this? Type of gear, you know, where you actually tie the line the fly pole, it doesn't have a real. I'm sorry, Hugh, I could only catch about half of that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try again. Use the Tenkara gear, that's where you, you tie the fishing line directly to the pole. Uh, rather than using a separate uh, 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 I'm not I'm not sure exactly. It sounds like you're talking about like a cane pole. Cane poles tie the line right on the end of the pole. Um, yes, it's it's practically like that. Only people use fly fishing. I don't know much about that. I, I, I've only used cane poles for like bluegills, you know, panfish. So that, you know, it might work if, if you trying to drop your fly in a real tight spot, you know, you can just drop it right down in a place where you couldn't even fly fish. So when it comes to fly fishing or fishing in general, you want to get your bait where the fish are. However, you can do that. That's that's how you do it. Hey, Brad. What do you use? Chest waders or hip waders? And do you wear a flotation device in case? Um, I I don't wear a flotation device when I'm waiting. Uh, Nine times out of ten, or usually, you know, when I'm in a boat, I'll wear it. But uh, um, as far as waders, that's a whole another subject. Like if I can whittle it down, um, in cold weather, in neoprene waders are great because they provide a lot of insulation. Um, I I wear I have chest waders and I have hip waders, and most of the time I wear my hip waders, I wish I had my chest waders on because you get into water that's too deep. And, you know, you can't go in and get your snag out or, or you can't cross the stream to the other side when you want to. So I think, you know, if a person was to start out, I would try to get chest waders, unless you're just gonna be fishing really small, small streams, then a hip wader is fine. But, um, if you can get a chest wader that has like the, uh, I forget what the material, the lightweight, you want to get the, the Gore-Tex type of wader. Um, rubber waders are fine in, in the spring and fall, but they usually last two or three years and then they, they get holes. Uh, they're cheap, rubber waders are cheap, but uh, they're inexpensive. But I, I would uh, recommend uh, chest waders. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, having water go over your hip, hip boots. But uh, another thing, I guess, uh, if it's a rocky bottom and a felt sole is good, if it's a muddy bottom, you know, the rubber sole is good. If you can get ones that, that come with the boot, 
you can buy waders that have like a stocking foot and then you put a boot over it. That gives you more flexibility too. Okay, maybe we should um, call it at that. Thanks very much for the presentation, Brad. It was uh, very informative and I know, I know there's a lot of fly fishing goes on at some of the state parks that, that we go to for different trips like Whitewater and uh, Forestville that, that I really love. Um, well, good. You bet, Barry. It was great. Thank you. Well, thanks, Brad.